thank you very much before we proceed uh, i would like if you can introduce yourself Okay, yes, well, I'm Wendy Harcourt. I'm um, a professor of gender diversity and sustainable development at the International Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University, Rotterdam, which is based in The Hague. Um, and I've been here for, I think now 10 years. Um, and I'm, I would say a, a, a critical development scholar and someone who's been working on feminist theory and practice. And in the last years, actually, I've been working on feminist political ecology. Um, and before that, I was working for the Society for International Development, um, which was the first international NGO founded in 1957. Based, uh, the secretary was based in Rome, and I was there, and I was editor of the journal Development, and I was also a uh, well, I was director of programs, um, where I focused in particular on gender and sexual health and reproductive rights issues, um, as well as I, I think a more general concern about um, yeah, what, what I would now call post-development issues. Yeah, thank you. And uh, actually I, am, um, I want to talk about uh, your book, uh, Body Politics in Development. And I have a few questions that I want to ask, and then I will uh, most likely share it with my students in the seminar. Okay, so my first question is about uh, the perception or misconception related to the gender biases in feminism, because we have that feminism have been uh, seen maybe differently uh, in mainstream theories, such as uh, in anthropology, sociology, psychology, and even in gender studies. So how do you interpret uh, these perspectives in connection with your book, uh, Body Politics in Development? Well, um... To, it's important to remember that that uh, book was actually written out of my own experience. Um, so I had done a PhD uh, some 20 years before, and then I had been part of, uh, let's say, advocacy work in, in development uh, with a focus on gender. And to some extent, I lived through the ways in which development went from the sort of women in development Europe uh, to the women and development to gender and development. Um, and then uh, I think we, to some extent, um, were always being very critical of the ways in which uh, people were being divided into what was naturally what women did or what naturally what men did, right? So very basic kind of bringing in um, the idea that there were many, first of all, different genders, not just men and women, but also that it really depended on context and positionality according to how gender roles played out. So I, that was really what I was learning in practice. And what I was seeing is the difference between feminist thinking, which was much more radical in some ways and much more embodied, and um, the ways in which that was interpreted in, in development policy and text. So in that sense, the, the book itself is not really going into, uh, let's say, disciplinary approaches. I guess you could look at it and say now, well, of course, there was a sort of idea of society and social understandings of gender, very important gender power roles. Um, and then there's also an anthropological interest because it's also about place and where people are in their different cultures. Um, and to some extent, an economic concern around how um, women, let's say, um, women's lack of access to resources, et cetera, uh, could be seen as sort of an economic rights concern. And, and in a way also then, of course, underlying that was human rights. So the book itself is really a reflection more of the places or the moments in time where I saw this critical difference between what women's movements, feminist movements were doing and what was being interpreted in development policy, uh, rather than really trying to link up with, um, I would suppose more um, sophisticated um, arguments around um, what is gender, what is the body, etc. Although in the first part of the book, in a way I revisit 20 years later, some of the things that informed my own PhD, which was looking at when gynecology and obstetrics was established um, in the 19th century. So I'm actually a historian as it happens. So in some ways I have a very historical way of looking at things because I see change over time as very 
important also when you're looking at concepts, including concepts of gender. Um, and I'm also very interested in um, the different narratives around gender rather than saying <clears throat> there's a particular um, theory that I then hold on to. I'm quite able to see very many different ways of understanding gender. Um, and I would say that in that way, the book is um, engaging as an outsider to academe, um, although of course it is in a sense an intellectual discussion around what is gender or what, a, what, is, body, what is body politics. All right. So, um, well, I had a chance to go through some of uh, the chapters in your book, um, and uh, definitely it is very interesting there, so I am here and talking with you. Um, when, when you say it's um, body politics, so how do you define and situate this term, uh, especially across uh, uh, the gender theories, already existing gender theories? I mean, do you see any interconnections that can be used to give an uh, interdisciplinary perspective on body politics? Yeah, it's interesting you're, you're, you're seeing into, into disciplinary. Um, whereas again, that book, the book itself, I mean, I'm not saying where I am now, but the, the book was really um, written because I was trying to explain why I think the body and the way people experience and understand um, different forms of oppression or um, different possibilities as well, um, is often left out in development. Um, so I was very in development policy and mainstream development at that perhaps at that particular time I think there of course uh, the book is also tracing how that changed so again just to get away from the notion that it's interdisciplinary I, I don't want to put and I think a lot of feminism doesn't want to put things into categories of this is anthropological this is um, sociological although of course you could or economic for that matter. I think the main thing is that I was trying to break down the idea that the most important thing is economic development. I think you have to see that as a key reason for writing the book and that, that um, the idea that you can only measure development. Uh, I was also trying to say you can feel and experience develop, development on your skin. And at the same time, I was also saying that, I mean, the, the, this is where it's a sort of philosophical thing, really, um, that, you know, women are being seen as the other to men many times, even if we want to break down that dualism. And indeed, in development, it was like the idea that you would add in women into what was already existing programs around how to, um, you know, so-called empower women was through in engaging them in a workforce as if they were meant at not taking into account all the other forms of social reproductive labor that they're doing. So um, the book itself in a way is, is really looking at where those quandaries happened, um, you know, in relation to, for example, domestic workers and the question of how do we bring in those lives into understanding development um, or also in relation to um, the, the women who have been put through um, so-called in those days population programs where they're being encouraged to um, have contraception or actually um, become uh, infertile through operations after they've had their child what sort of a, a child you know often without choice even men also this idea of encouraging men to have vasectomies. This was famous in India in the 70s. So it was also considering whose choices and who determines what is um, the right choice for, for women. And I could see the, the body there was uh, somehow excluded. It was all about um, the numbers of children you want, or it was all about what was considered healthy. It wasn't actually about the embodied need for some women um, in terms of themselves or in terms of their community to have children. Um, because that was also the way in which their status could be established. So I was really asking those sorts of questions. Um, perhaps later as I've gone into academia, um, after writing the book, I, I could start to say, well, this was, as, as I said earlier, anthropological or sociological or economic. But it was really trying to get a sense of body politics as itself an important thing to look at, the body, um, how you experience development and what sorts of practices were around the body um, that were often being not even discussed or seen as invisible or not important to development because it was all seen in terms of economics. 
Mm. Yeah, uh, it is interesting because uh, I had a chance to do research in um, in in a, in southern Punjab in in Pakistan when I was doing my PhD, and because I was working on child care belief practices and social value of the child, and I I had a chance to interview with the childless women and the mothers, and I see that in in Pakistan or in in the global south, maybe uh, if I, I if I generalize it in a global south context, I see that. Uh, female uh, or m- women uh, who have children, they become actually women beings. And before that, they are just women becoming. So fertility is uh, seen as a kind of token of visibility or social visibility. And um, well, actually they are, I mean, we are overpopulated countries. So uh, people don't want uh, too much children because they cannot afford. But even then, the women that I interviewed who were childless, they think that if they will not have a child, then they will be seen as a failure at social level and an economic level, and they will not have a social network, not have access to several things. So I just wonder that when you use this uh, um, understanding of body politics, do you see any uh, difference between global south and global north? <laughs> yeah, no, of course. And you've just pointed to exactly what I was saying before that the concept of being able to have children give status to um, particularly economically marginalized groups of people, but also in other contexts as well. So I think there is a difference. And one of the things that I would probably do differently now is um, to be able to um, listen more. Well, I, I traveled a lot. That was one reason that I was able to think about these things and see things in different contexts and talk to different people. Um, but certainly, of course, there's a difference um, in terms of, um, well, you would see that in, in Sweden where you are now. The idea of um, equality, for example, is, is understood very differently um, in terms of access of women and men to different resources, including choices about whether they have children or not. And it's not seen as a status or a way in which you identify yourself. It's an additional thing to your life. It's a real choice. Um, and indeed, the government um, allows for, for men to be on paternity leave as much as women. And I, I've been, I've visited Lund and Sweden, and you do see men um, clearly looking after children and wanting to be part of that. Whereas in other, let's say, well, the global south context, different contexts, you, you would see women being the ones responsible for children and that not being part of how you um, perform, if you like, as a man in that society. The thing that I was really trying to get at is that, yes, of course, it's different in different contexts and you have to look very deeply into each context to understand it. And uh, just to say Pakistan, there are many different groups in Pakistan. If you're living in Karachi, it's going to be very different if you're living in a in a remote tribal rural area. All of those things we kind of know, but that's one thing I think that I was trying to say is that um, we need to be able to if we're talking about development as an aspiration for more justice, for greater social justice, then we also have to have ways of talking about um, how the gendered body is allowing or not allowing people to have these aspirations, right? So I think that was to me very important. And women were always being, I saw um, a kind of, even if I'm, um, I'm Australian, although I've been living in Europe for many years, um, and I'm obviously white, etc. But and I have privilege. All of these things. Uh, there was still a sense in which um, I was connecting with different women just because I travelled with my children, or I had. There was some mm. sort of thing where my sense of being female and bodied and being able to have children did determine the ways in which other people saw me. So I was also interested, not in that as a universal experience, but just that that was something that was kind of not part of the development. Um, policy it was seen as yes too many people well, you said it yourself we have too many people rather than uh, women being able to aspire to um, equality or to justice um, but somehow because of their um, reproductive function or the type of availability they were expected to have to have children etc um, they were not therefore not seen as being able to participate in you know the really important things in development 
if you see what I mean. So that, that to me was what I was interested in or trying to critique and trying to get to, to say that the body is part of development that, and these sorts of positionings of different gendered bodies um, were excluding um, people just, just because of the gender they had. And it's very hard to undo that one, if people don't talk about it. And that's, I think what I was trying to get was to put body politics as a political um, topic, something that you need to change, you need to talk about, you need to listen to people who are feeling oppressed, but it was, it, it's not about health. It's not about, you know, um, just whether you can have children or not biologically. It's actually all the social and cultural and actually economic constructs around that, which you see when you compare Sweden with say Pakistan, which I'm sure you do <laughs> in your everyday experiences. Yeah, because, um, well, I, I just uh, got uh, something in my mind. I was just remembering that uh, I was, because I have been in Norway for six years when I was doing PhD. In Norway and in Sweden as well, uh, the immigrants from the global south, they have more children as compared to the Swedish or Norwegian people. And when um, I asked some of them that uh, why you tend to have more children, even if, if there is not a compulsion on you that you must have children because you're living in a welfare state even and they said that, yes, we are living in a welfare state and with every child, we get a lot of money. <laughs> so it means that, don't, do you think that uh, this policy that giving money for every child, well, it helps in some way the underpopulated countries. But on the other hand, it also pressurizes the women uh, to have more children so that they can have more money. Well, yeah, I, I, I've, I've never, I, I think what you're saying is very interesting. I mean... The, 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 the deeply centered idea of you as a woman being able to have a child, I think, is something that is there. Um, and that's where queering development is really challenging us to think about that differently. And I'm, I'm of a generation where I'm listening and trying to think through that. But um, as you see in my book, in a way, I, I, I recognize it, but it's not something I'm able to understand exactly where, where to go with that. But Similarly, um, I'm not being in a position to, you know, have to have be that economically dependent on needing welfare, right? So that's not something that I think I grew up in Australia where everybody got um, a child allowance, it was called. Um, and it was important, for example, for my mother because she didn't have her own income. So she could use that income. Actually, of course, in her, her we were middle class in her way. This was money that she could then use for our education apart from the school or whatever. Um, but it was important to her because she felt it was her money, she could use it. So in that sense, um, and in Italy now, they also give money for people who have more than three children. So it's still there, um, but I think it depends who actually controls the money. Because there's something about if you are at home, and not able to access the workforce because you're looking after children, you don't have any other choices. And I, I could see my mother had four children. In those days, that was the sort of norm. Um, th it was important to her. It, it gave her some of her own income. Uh, so I'm not, when you say you imply, the way you ask the question, it sort of implied that these people were just getting children in order to get money, but maybe because of the way the social structures are those women couldn't get any other sorts of jobs so i don't know if it's pressure we'd have to really look at it that's one thing i've learned more as an academic you'd need to really do a study of that and not jump to conclusions um of course you that's where for me qualitative um research is important rather than quantitative but your point about there being immigrants in sweden or, or norway is it is also something that breaks down a bit um, the way we talk about global south, global north, because they're also, maybe they're getting access to more economic possibilities and, as you say, welfare state, but they're still perhaps having a different sense of self than someone who was born in Norway and uh, to, um, I don't know what you would say, indigenous Norwegians or indigenous Swedes, uh, meaning people who are... Um, uh, well, I guess in this case, it would be mostly white, uh, middle class or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So I think it is important that we also differentiate between 
who are the people living in this global north and their own experience. I mean, certainly now we see, we're seeing every everywhere, I mean, living in Italy, um, very different kinds of um, possibilities according to your race um, and your background where you were born. So that's another issue, which I think I also, if, if I was to rewrite body politics, I think the racialization of development, I'd be much more aware of. Um, I mean, I think I was aware of it, but it was something that um, perhaps I didn't see how much it was embedded in um, development processes. Hmm. Yeah. And, and rightly, um, I mean, you said that qualitative research would be very useful. <clears throat> and that makes me remind that uh, when you, you when you said that there might there might be a perspective that should be explored through a ground up investigation, uh, so that we can find out how the things are being con constructed uh, on political and cultural and social level among people. Yeah, um, one question that uh, sometimes I have in my mind, maybe it's not related to the book, but uh, it is good to share with you. I have uh, you here. Uh, when we visit market and we see. Uh, the cloth, for example, they are female cloths and male cloths, I mean, clothings and dressing. And uh, the whole market uh, in everywhere, uh, I, I have seen more classified male and female clothing here as compared to uh, some other countries uh, in Global South. Maybe they have a very different, uh, uh, I mean, they are quite segregated parts, male and female, but here we, we see in the market. Because I remember that uh, someone bought a shirt from the market and brought uh, for his son and his son said no this is a girl shirt and uh, then he asked him how did you know this is a girl shirt he said look and he showed something on, on the shirt some design on, on the back of the shirt and he said look this is a girl shirt I will not wear it and now I am just thinking that if your products I mean that is related to your cover your body they are being classified. Do you think that if you, they will not do it there, the, cons the consumer market, they can be affected in a way? If we will go into the equality of clothing in a way that human body should not be covered in a way that they should be gendered, segregated by the child. So what do you think, how, how, how it will work? That, that, I think that's a really fascinating question. I mean, one thing is that um, it's also, and I'm not sure what ground I'm on here. Obviously clothing is also about identity, but it's also about being desirable and enjoyment, right? It's not only a negative thing. Clothing can, it can be super in, enjoyable. You dress up, you, 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 you enjoy that. And part of that, of course, is sexual attraction. So I would say it, it's not only about genders, it's also about a sort of heteronormative idea that you dress for the other gender. So what you do see in queer fashion is they dress differently, right? They, they deliberately make you, uh, I remember, <laughs> I mean, we're just chatting really, but I mean, I do remember the, um, the Eurovision contest run by an Israeli singer who had a beard and then, a, you know, very beautiful with a beard and then a, a woman, women's dress, really making you question what that is. And um, so I think we're also breaking down a bit what is male, what is female, at least in this sort of body politics. sense. I think that's highly political when people are dressing um, to not look as if they are a man or a woman, right? I mean, and to, to say that there's some, some things in between. So I know that uh, blue jeans were seen as the, the, the thing that all um, people could wear. The original jeans were work, workers' jeans, and then that was adopted. And as you have seen over the years, how jeans have gone through all sorts of fashions. And now they, they were, you would be wearing when I was young, you bought Levi jeans or Lee jeans, at least in Australia, and there was not really a difference between men and women. Then they started to make those differences because jeans became what everybody wore. It was something that um, when I grew up, it was a sort of thing to show that you were, um, we would have said cool or something. So then now it's become not particularly a fashionable thing, but it's definitely all sorts of sizes are in jeans, right? You can, if you go into, 
a, a shop or even if you're buying secondhand clothes, it's definitely the different shapes and sizes, which are meant to fit different shapes and bodies. So it's not only about um, women and men, it's also if you're tall or thin or curvy or whatever. So fashion is just moving into so many ways, consuming, getting us to consume in different ways. Uh, and in a way, cleverly um, adapting to the idea or you shouldn't be fat shaming. So then you have special genes for people who can sort of be rounded and then they're the, for very thin people, it's like that. So I see fashion as not only about gender, but also about getting people to buy and to um, sort of goes beyond looking different in that sense, uh, differently like men and women. But at the same time, um, so it's not only about gender, it's also about cons consumption and consumerism. And then I, I definitely think, and this maybe is something I'm not sure if you're interested in, but I mean, I think age is very important there, depending on how old you are, what kind of clothes you can wear. So it's, it's not only gender, it's also what looks appropriate, um, also what kind of job you do. So there's all sorts of things that clothes are showing not only gender, but also your status, your identity, not only because you can afford to buy something, but because you're in an office, you should, unspoken rules, you only wear, you know, a suit or whatever. And you really make statements of self um, when it comes to clothes, not only of gender. Um, but nevertheless, you're right. The, the, I mean, especially when we're all watching and seeing pictures of Afghanistan now. And the main thing with the Taliban is that women then have to totally cover themselves and interviews with young women, clearly finding that um, uh, uh, oppressive. And yet at the same time, you can also see that that's also part of a culture and a, a way of being that, you know, is much more important. You have to look at all the other things that go with it. So clothes, yeah, I think they're important, but they're also significant about other, other issues, which I think are even more important. But um, I remember very much when I was going to places to speak, I always ask, what, is, what kind of clothes would be appropriate for me to wear? And I didn't only mean it in terms of being a woman, I also meant in terms of, you know, is it okay I wear uh, jeans? Is it okay I wear a long, or should I wear a long dress? Should I cover, should I have a scarf? How should I, you know, should I not have my, you know, body bared at all? All of these things. So I totally agree with you. It's very gendered in that sense, um, in right. interesting ways. Yeah, and, and uh, in the last couple of questions now, um, do you think that, uh, because when we say men and women, uh, I mean, the first thing that, that need to need, uh, that we need to differentiate is uh, the biological uh, uh, way. I mean, biologically, you define someone, man and woman, girl and boy, whatever. And do you think this biological essentialism, because it, it is seen as a universal, it is universally interpreted into gender or it is differently uh, seen in different countries? Because if it is, uh, not universally interpreted into gender, then we cannot have uh, a generalized uh, uh, policies to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to mark gender equality uh, um, everywhere. Yeah, I suppose it's not about, that's where gender is not just about men or women. It's also um, hijras and people who relate as um, third gender. So in Indonesia, you, it, it, there are many cultures where indigenous cultures also in North America, I mean, but also in, in Australia where in people are seen as um, neither women nor men, and they can often be seen as spiritually very important, shamans or whatever. So I think um, there's, first of all, not to divide people into men and women, that's not universal, but gender equality is not about that. That's about saying that whatever gender you have, you should have access, equal resources, have the same rights, have the same um, dignity, all of those things that we uh, development aspires to. So in that way, I'm, I, I do really embrace, mm -hmm. if you like, this fourth wave of, of feminism, which has helped us see that it's important not to divide in this, what we understand as a biological body. Um, as either male or female, and that some people, are, of course, are born 
with different kinds of genitalia, but that's not the point at all. There's very many different ways in which we construct genders, um, not only related to the body. That's just one, one way of understanding um, differences. And there could be very different. I mean, that's why we started talking about femininity, masculinity, but with an S of so femininities, masculinities, and also seeing um, that there are many genders in between, a kind of extreme male and, and female. So when when so I think that's important to recognize, not as a Western concept, but that's something that's come out of many different cultures. And there's a lot of studies of that, but that was before in like cultural anthropology or medical anthropology. And now people are starting to see, well, actually, there's a, it's not just some sort of strange, abnormal thing. It's, that's also repeated in different places, but it's been tabooed or hushed up or, 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 or particularly if you look at all the and sort of uh, um, homophobic laws that have put in has also been a very particular historical moment of the British Empire or imposing, say, in the African states or even to some extent in the Indian and Pakistani context, a particular way of understanding gender, which has a very historical mm -hmm. moment that is not necessarily re related at all to how people live their everyday lives. Right. And when we say that... Uh... The women come into the protest in, in, in Global South, maybe, and they say, my body, my right. And in that way, they, 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 they can deny to have children. Uh, but on the other hand, we see that in those countries, it's difficult to survive if you don't have child because it gives you empowerment and it gives you access to the resources. So do you think that the feminism fails there or something? No, I think that's where, uh, again, you know, there's not all one Pakistani woman um, or, or one um, Ugandan woman or, or man for that matter. Uh, it depends very much also on class, on, gen on, on age, and also on, um, yeah, your, your religious and ethnic beliefs about what sorts of choices you might make. I mean, there, there are uh, women who make choices to be nuns and they have a lot of privilege, uh, I mean, the same with men. So I think we have to be careful not to make big uh, assumptions. Um, and, and when it's, um, I think one of the things that has happened since I wrote the book is this concept of menstrual activism, where uh, I, I wrote in the book a little bit about it, the idea of um, menstruation being a taboo in the way that I also talked about female genital mutilation as being tabooed and the importance of talking about these sorts of issues which were so difficult um, at one point. And in terms of menstruation, that's something that Global South women, women from the Global South have become very vocal in saying that um, it's, it shouldn't be seen as dirty or something that excludes. Um, and yeah, it's shameful. And I think that's something that is also very important that we're looking at this kind of body politics, which is really brought to the fore what was silenced and something that uh, women uh, were meant to bear, for example, you know, in, 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 um, a sort of responsibility and, and pain um, um, without any resource to, um, you know, for, for change. So I think that, that those mm -hmm. sorts of feminist protests are really important as well. Um, and, and these are very recent and um, it's something that I've really learned a lot from my, my family, uh, not my family, my PhD, sorry, which I sometimes think of as my family, I guess. But um, So I think these are things that, it, and again, as I said, um, there are things like slut walks, people saying that, that they, you know, women should be able to uh, wear what they want to wear and not be seen as being raped. I mean, something like Black Lives Matters that black people have the right to be where they want to be without being seen as immediately criminal. So it's, it's not only about, as I say, gender, it's also about um, other issues, but I think the body politics part of it is, race is also part of a body politics. And so is, uh, as is um, uh, issues like uh, menstruation or pregnancy about how, or, or, and the need to be able to choose if you have children or not. Yeah, very interesting. Um, Wendy, if you will, for example, if you had a chance to write an other version of this book, Body Politics and Development, what do you think that, uh, what would be the point of departure uh, to write another book on body politics development when you compare it with your uh, earlier book? 
Well, it's what we, what I, that was a um, very personal um, sort of I book. It was very much um, me trying to work out things and the, the privilege I had of being able to travel and meet with different people and the job I had enabled me and, and, and my, of course, my political advocacy, et cetera, allowed me to have, have these interesting um, moments in my life, which I could then reflect on. So it was very much about self-reflection in a kind of feminist way. So I think I would, really remove the eye from from the from the book and be more uh, listening to others and other experiences uh, um, and, and, and push myself a lot deeper into um, things that are not determined just by economic um, need but to see these development as an aspiration to what like what what is the kind of um, modern body that people are trying to aspire to because I think it's also one of the things as I mentioned I'm very concerned about um, environment and the issue of consumerism of course comes in there and it also comes in about maybe it's beyond just the human body but also other bodies around us and the the linkages that um, or the relations sorry that we would have with those I think I'd be interested to learn from different people about um, peoples not just because I very much focused on women of I, I mean I, I see that when I look back at the book so I think it's it's talking to, to maybe trying to yeah push to see well what what exists beyond um capitalism or modernity and, and what sorts of ways in which we could learn from those narratives and stories and uh, just if I could be a ventriloquist or someone who could interpret those things, then in a, um, yeah, in, a, in the same sort of, um, I really tried to make it stories, right? So I think I would like to continue that. Um, maybe centered not so much on the body, but perhaps care or care for others or something like that. Yeah. But I think it's something, yeah, let's see. <laughs> I'm hoping I would like to, to write um, one more book on that. I've been asked if I would do it, but um, that's the problem with teaching, as you probably know, you don't get your time to do your ah, work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I, I look forward for a new edition. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and the last question that uh, uh, it's about seeking suggestion from you uh, about the research methodologies. For example, if... Uh, our students in PhD and uh, in master's students, and even the young researchers, they want to investigate body, body politics in the context of gender development in contemporary world. What do you think the, within the qualitative research, what research methodologies would be suitable for them? Yeah, well, I, I, I supervise, of course, um, students doing just that, I mean, PhDs and MAs. Um, it's very much um, about, being embedded, I mean, this maybe makes me sound like an anthropologist, but being embedded in um, the different groups and being part of their everyday understanding of what's going on. So to learn from experience with, with people. Um, and yes, of course, using um, focus group discussions, interviews, being able to, um, though for me, importantly, be part of something so that you're not just coming in and extracting the knowledge, but you're actually um, working through something with people so that also defining the research with them so for example if you're doing something on menstrual activism um, I, was, I was just talking about that then um, to, to be consciously aware and, and see the ways in which um, those campaigns can be supported by your work and the ways in which you're doing it is not just um, facts and figures from them, but also going to give them something back. Um, so to be part of a, if you like, a project that, or campaign or particular goal that they might have as a group. So to be, um, I mean, it's a bit of a participatory, uh, I suppose, participatory ac action or um, doing research, which is, is meaningful and in, intentional. Um, and definitely the idea of listening um, and learning from people, so the ground up approach. But of course, for me, then the theories that you have around um, can help you then make sense of what you find. So I really encourage people to be more embedded in their 
often they're coming with the question they want to ask because they're interested in it or have been part of something. So to um, this idea of strong objectivity, just be very aware of how you're positioned and um, be able to explain exactly where you've come to these ideas and in what processes you've used. Um, also from your own awareness of, of where you, by coming in and asking questions, might have shifted the process or whatever. I hope, I mean, so it's qualitative, but it's also participatory. And um, in terms of methodologies, it's definitely grounded, ground up theory, I would say, working with what you find and using theory, theorizing from what you find rather than the other way. That's, that's what I, I also think, like to think I do as well. And I think also, well, obviously, I, I, I think storytelling or, or, or using narratives and always checking back with the people that you've been involved with um, are these stories that they recognize and uh, thinking about some of the corrections you might need to do you might not have seen something you know always being surprised by what uh, what you're coming across I think is important yeah and that's what was I going to ask but you have already given the answer because I was just thinking that uh, if uh, this researcher will go with the already existing theory driven approach then maybe uh, he or she would not be able to find something different. But you have already answered the question. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy. It's a great deal of knowledge. Uh, reading a textbook is a knowledge, but talking to the author is, is a great deal of knowledge. And I am very happy that you're here. Uh, I am grateful.